Dear Chairman, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear Professor Fatemi, dear Barbara, thank you very much for the kind invitation today for speaking to you something which may be a bit strange for you on an IVF Congress, but um, the MRKRH syndrome is something which is a syndrome which I'm working on since now more than 15 years. And um, although those women are not supposed to get any child born by their self because they have no vagina and no uterus, it is something which I would like to encourage you that you know at least this disease after this session. So um, if these are my conflict of interest, and if we are just looking, what is a MRKRH syndrome? If I ask my colleague, um, those colleagues do not think about a patient coming to them in the age of 16 with primary amenorrhea. They are not thinking about an MRKRH syndrome. But MRKRH means that there is no vagina and that there is no uterus. But, and that is very important, and this comes important even later, there are normal ovaries, and it's a normal pheno and genotype. And along with going, having no vagina and no uterus, you have to be aware that there are associated malformation in about 30% conducting the uterine tract or the skeletal system. And it's a rare malformation, but not that rare. If you think about one of a 4,500 female newborn is affected by this congenital malformation, this counts for about 8,000 women living in Germany. And as I told you, gynecologists are not thinking about an MRKRH syndrome when the patient presents with primary amenorrhea. And this is because of the outside, looking at the outside of the genital of these women. They are looking quite normal. If you compare it to this picture from the Nether Atlas, you can see that you have, there is the catheter in the urethra, and you can see you have a normal clitoris, you have a normal looking like a vaginal hymen here. It looks like it is, uh, yeah, an opening of a vagina, but if you look behind, there is no vagina at all. So you have to know that this condition really exists, and then we are not accelerating more of our misdiagnosis, which have been up to 40% in the population I have been seen over the last 15 years. So I conducted something like a mnemonic. This means the three A. If you have an asymptomatic amenorrhea in a young girl at the age of 15, please think about an aplasia and do not think about an imperfect hymen and try to open this hymen because then it will start to bleed and there will not be old blood, it will be fresh blood. So if you are going out of this room today and you know that this exists, I would be very happy. So if we go back and think about um, diagnostic, if you have this condition, you do an ultrasound, you take, of course, the history of the patient. We do always a chromosome analysis and we do also a neuro MRI because, as I told you, 30% of those patients could have kidney malformation, having only one kidney, or the kidney could be located in the pelvis. And it's sometimes not obvious if you do a laparoscopy in those patients that, for example, this is a kidney. This is not the bowel surrounded by tissue. This is a pelvic kidney lowering in the right lower pelvis. This is a rudiment of the malarian duct where the uterus is not built off. This is a fallopian tube. You think, no, this is not a fallopian tube and this is not an ovary. This is a testis. So if you do a laparoscopy and look at them, you could think that could be an MRKRH syndrome. No, this is an androgen insensitivity syndrome. So this is a genitally male. 
not normally. They look from the outside normal as a female. So do all your workup, what I told you, and then you are sure you have an MRKRH syndrome. And as this is not that obvious, the ESHA and the ESGE developed a new classification, and we will have a talk later about uterine anomalies, and their classification is very much important because you have to know what you are talking about so that you can have the good and the right treatment for everybody. So going back to treatment modalities, which was my um, talk today, and you have this little girl with a 16-year-old and she wants to have normal sexual intercourse because that's the first thing what she's concerned of. She's coming, having not her bleeding, and in her 16 age, in her puberty, she's not feeling like a woman herself because you as a doctor have to tell her you have no vagina, you will not have a good relationship, probably you will have um, pain with sexual intercourse if it's it's not really not possible. And at the end, you will have no born own child because you have no uterus. So it was my interest to invent a very good solution for surgery and creation of a near vagina. There is one method, which is a non-operative method, where you can do a dilation of the vaginal dimple, which is normally around 0.5 centimeters, and dilate by yourself, by the patient herself. You can do that, but sometimes it's very painful, and it goes back if you have no sexual intercourse all the time, and you can have prolapse of this new creation of the vagina. So um, I thought about an operative creation of a vagina without any skin or bowel transplantation. And I went back to the method which is called the Vecchietti method, which is a stretching method of the vaginal dimple. And we created new in terms of inventing a new instrument and we changed the, um, the system that we do not dissect anymore the bowel and the bladder from the vaginal dimple, from the peritoneum, and that we um, do not uh, need any um, any more putting the traction device very low. So we have a minimal invasive surgical method. You can do it via endoscopy. And um, this is the instrument which we developed many years ago, which is now FDA approved as well, and which we can use in the US as well. And the principle is that we go through this little vaginal dimple between the bladder and the rectum without dissecting it, putting in the threads, pulling the threads out and putting them on a traction device like that. And there it stays for about four to five days only. And then we have created a vagina from 0.5 centimeters to 10 centimeters without any transplanted tissue. So here I have a little short video. So we put in those threads through the vaginal dimple in the abdomen bring them out of the abdomen, attach them to this direction device, and then daily tension um, the threads, and then we get a creation of this vagina. And we have now done more than 400 of these patients with really good results. So these are the, the surgical videos. If you look at the bladder, this is the inside of the bladder, because you have to know that the bladder is very close to the rectum and then you go through this little vaginal dimple um, and just perforate it but be aware that here is the urethra down is the rectum and you have to guide it with your laparoscope so that you really can go through it and that you have the right direction and it's very important that you put the rectum down and that you go inside and if you think that it is painful afterward with the traction device, those patients, they have an epidural for about four to five days, um, and um, then 
they have no pain at all. So this is the laparoscopic guidance. So you can see this is the rectum. This is the finger in the rectum. Above there is the bladder. And this between bladder and rectum, this is the, the dimple or this is the rudiment of the um, malarian duct where you have just to go below it and bring it inside. And then you have those threads which you then um, guide through the peritoneum. First you make it a little tunnel, take then the threads and pull them out again and then pull them into the um, traction device. You have to be aware because there are some vessels, the iliac vessels for example, that you do not want to touch and to hurt. But at the end um, it really works very well and you do it from both sides and then pull the threads out and then you have it here, the traction device, which is just placed on the abdomen and the threads will go then, um, which you can see here, inside. And then after about four to five days, you just take off the traction device, remove the dummy, the stretching dummy from the vagina and then you have like a little hole. And this is very much important. This mere vagina is not yet fully epitalized. That means that it goes together again. If you will not wear a dummy, which this one, which is 10 centimeter long, three centimeter in diameter with estrogen cream. And this cream and this dummy helps that it epitalize from outside to inside in about four to six months. We allow the patient to have sexual intercourse after four weeks. And astonishingly, I don't know what's inside the sperm, but sexual intercourse helps the epitalization. If they have regular sexual intercourse, they have after at least three to four months, they have a fully epitalized neo-vagina. Those who have not nearly need half a year to seven months. But the good thing is, and this is very much important, and this is important for one step further, we create a totally normal vaginal epithelium. We did histological biopsies and we cannot see any difference between the near vaginal epithelium and the normal vaginal epithelium. Even HP virus likes this epithelium, so we encourage those patients for vaccination as well. So we have a neovagina which stays stable over many, many years, even if they have no sexual intercourse and do not wear the dummy anymore once it is fully epitalized. And we have the same female sexual function index. So it's anatomically and functional, a really normal vagina compared to age-matched controlled group. So if you compare these results from the so-called Vecchietti in the meta-analysis which was done here, you have um, uh, one of the highest FSI you ever could get, which is very normal, and you have a really high success rate. In this meta-analysis, they say it, there could be dyspareunia, we never saw this, but very much important, the first step of these MRKRH patients is to create a normal functional neovagina without transplantation, without having vaginal discharge, if you do a colon vagina, for example, without the risk of graft rejection, if you do a skin neovagina. And why is this so important? This is so important because those patients are the patients who could be a candidate for uterine transplantation. And if you already have a graft from the bowel, for example, with a lot of discharge and bacteria, and you attach this bowel to a uterus, and then you have immunosuppression, that could be a huge problem. Or if you already have a graft rejection from the skin near vagina, and you put them on immunosuppression during uterine transplantation, you have a problem. And if you have a too short vagina with shrinks, you have a problem because the patient cannot have regular menses and have any, um, um, any sexual intercourse afterwards. 
So this is all the things which now in the next generation of these patients being candidate for uterine transplant heads, you have to be in mind what type of neovagina will you create in those patients. And just go to the next step from dream to reality, the uterine transplantation project. I brought this with me because we did two uterine transplantation in Germany already. And Matt Spranstam, who was the one in Sweden who did the first nine transplantation, um, he did a huge job in developing this issue because he started really from animal-based research. And this was a huge step going further so that at the end, the first uterine transplantation really upon is... Well, the first ever happened in Saudi Arabia, you know about that, it was a living donor, but this was without any research, it didn't work. And then 11 years later, um, just on the concept of Professor Brandstrom in 2011, and then in 2012, the really uh, trial on uterine transplantation started. And this is a, the, the, I like it and call it the domino surgical method, because as I told you, you need to know what type of neovagina you are doing before you go further to uterine transplantation. And as I have been in close contact over 14 nearly years now with Matt Sprenstrom, bringing the neovagina creation to Sweden, and he then said, okay, I will bring the uterine transplantation to Germany. This was the main reason why we could do and establish a multidisciplinary team in Tübingen and perform the first uterine transplantation in Germany. But not thinking that you do uterine transplantation and half a year later the patient is pregnant, no. It takes more than two years from the start of this project from one single patient until you can hope that she gets pregnant because the selection is of course a real hard job because it's still a living donor procedure. Then you do the uterine transplantation. Before you do an IVF procedure, well, you do a retrieval of the oocyte and then you need one year to wait until you can start the embryo transfer. <coughs> so if we are here on the IVF Congress, I just brought two slides with me. So we did a classical antagonist protocol. We had three patients. We, um, they were um, between 23 and 34 years old. And um, this was our stimulation dose per day. And we fertilized those number of um, cryopreserved um, oocytes. And then we did the uterine transplantation. We start with explantation in one OR. We did the perfusion of the uterus and then we did the implantation. And this was the huge team because we had to perform it in two ORs. And at the end, we saw a very good perfusion here of the um, conjunction of the anastomosis. And we could look at it for about five days afterwards. And this is the current status worldwide in uterine transplantation. So there are about 40, uh, 52 patients transplanted, and there are already um, 11 healthy children born after uterine transplantation. So the conclusion I would like to bring to you, please be aware that there is a condition called MRKH syndrome. Don't think about High, imperfect hymen, for example, if you have those patients in front of you. Please be assured that you do the right diagnosis. And keep in mind, there is a procedure which is minimal invasive where you can create a neovagina. And think about which type of neovagina you will create in terms of the future of those patients towards uterine transplantation. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>